Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Anthony Valeri, Director of Investment Management in Wealth and Fiduciary Services. Thanks for very much for joining. With me today is Robert Spendlove, Economic and Public Policy Officer. And together, we are going to provide an outlook for the economy and financial markets over the second half of 2022. So with that, let's get right into it. Robert, I'll let you take it away on the economy. Great. Thanks so much, Anthony. So we're in a really unique time right now in the economy. Uh, there's, we're kind of in a transitionary period, really. Uh, there's, and you know, there, there's uh, times when this happens where we have a pivot in the economy, and uh, the and we see these uh, uh, periods of dramatic change. And so we're in that right now. Um, uh, tomorrow, the uh, 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 Bureau of Labor Statistics will be releasing their new estimate of inflation for uh, for the for the month of June. The big question right now is: Has that inflation peaked? Uh, what we do know, so there was a, there, there was an estimate, or some analysts were thinking that that inflation may have peaked in uh, uh, in April of this year. Then when we got the May numbers, we saw that that inflation went up again. We're now at a multi-decade high, the highest inflation that we've seen since the early 1980s. But even if you look at that inflation, that was a period when inflation was coming down. If you look at a period when inflation was going up, you really have to go back to the late 1970s where we've seen these kind of economic conditions with that inflation uh, going up dramatically. Now, the reason, one of the big reasons why we're seeing this higher inflation is because the big increases in energy prices. That's uh, That has a, a, a strong impact on those inflation numbers. Um, and I expect that when we get the new inflation number tomorrow, uh, that we will see that inflation go up a little bit more. Uh, we may be uh, uh, 8.8%. Um, or, or I, I don't think we'll be above 9%, but the kind of the consensus expectation is because the, the high gas prices that we saw earlier this year uh, or uh, in June, that that inflation will go up. Uh, next slide. However, and this is, this is the really hard part, we're seeing these contradictory uh, economic readings. If you look over just the last few weeks, we've seen a dramatic change. So this is looking at commodity prices. Uh, look at the price of oil. So we kind of hit that high in mid-June, and since then, oil prices have dropped dramatically. Uh, natural gas prices, uh, oil prices specifically, if you just look at today, Oil prices uh, uh, are down to $95 a barrel. It's down 8% just in the last day. So we're seeing a dramatic reversal of, the, uh, of that oil price. If you look at the price of corn, it's down 6% just today. The price of copper is down 5% today. And the price of wheat is down 5% today. Uh, interestingly, wheat, wheat prices really spiked uh, as a result of the Russia-Ukraine uh, conflict, but wheat prices are now back down below uh, the level where they were before uh, Russia invaded Ukraine. So we are seeing a, a, a pretty dramatic weakening in commodity prices just over the last few weeks. Uh, next slide. Uh, a big reason for this is, you know, if you kind of think about your, your basics of economics, it's supply and demand. And we've seen a dramatic shift in demand just over the last few weeks. So this is the University of Michigan uh, Consumer uh, Sentiment Survey. They've been conducting this survey for the last 50 years. And when we got the latest reading for June, uh, it came in at the lowest level uh, they've ever recorded, uh, came in at, at a, a, a basis of 50. And so we are seeing a, a, a very dramatic and very uh, uh, quick uh, degradation of consumer sentiment. Next slide. The next one, and this is again part of the University of Michigan's, it's part of the same survey. Uh, one of the questions they say is, uh, ask is, where do you think inflation will be a year from now? So in, in inflation expectations. Uh, and we, we're, sit, we're hitting, uh, these aren't historic highs in the expectation, but it is much higher than we've seen recently. Uh, coming in at 5.3%. Uh, this chart alone is one of the reasons why uh, the Federal Reserve and Jerome Powell have been very concerned 
about our inflation readings. Uh, essentially, if people expect inflation to be high, then they start to change their behaviors based on that expectation. So if uh, individuals, if consumers, if families expect inflation to stay high, uh, then it kind of becomes self-fulfilling. And so this is something that the Fed is, uh, uh, is very uh, concerned about and is going to take strong action to counteract. Next slide. So if we look at uh, kind of our broadest indicator of the economy, uh, it's gross domestic product. And this is really the value of all goods and services in the economy. What we saw is that in the first quarter of this year, uh, GDP uh, contracted. Um, we're, we're now past the second quarter, uh, and we'll be getting our uh, reading of the second quarter GDP at the end of this month on, uh, on the uh, 28th. But there are pretty strong indications uh, that the Atlanta Fed has a, a GDP forecast tool, and their forecast from the Atlanta Fed is that GDP will contract 1.2% uh, in the second quarter. So we're seeing, if you kind of uh, uh, look at different indicators, you're really seeing that mix. You're seeing that, that slowdown in economic growth. Now, uh, kind of the popular definition of a recession is two consecutive quarters of negative GDP, um, but that's not the actual definition of a recession. And this is one of the debates going on among economists right now, is are we in a recession right now? If we're not in a recession right now, is one coming? Or the, the, the kind of third option is, will we see a slowdown, but not actually go into a recession? So this is uh, one of the big questions. I, I, I'm, I, I'm pretty confident however, that we will see uh, two consecutive quarters of, uh, uh, of contracting GDP. Next slide. But this gives us the other side. Um, and this is, uh, you know, this is why there's this active deba debate. Uh, when you look at, so what we've seen is we've got really high inflation. We've uh, got consumer confidence that's uh, deteriorating. We're seeing commodity prices uh, coming down. We're, uh, you know, seeing uh, contracting GDP but the job market continues to be very strong. We just got this data uh, last week that shows that in the month of June, uh, em employers added 372,000 jobs, which is consistent with what we've seen for the last few months. Uh, we're seeing between around 400 and 500,000 jobs created per month for the past several months. Uh, and our long-term or our uh, average over the last year is around uh, 500,000. So it is a little bit slower than we saw in previous months, but it's uh, in line with what we've seen recently. Next slide. And then in addition to that, uh, we continue to have a dramatic labor shortage in America. Right now, there are two job openings for every unemployed person in America. 11.3 um, million job openings, uh, much higher than job hiring. So there, there's a, a huge demand for available labor. Next slide. And we also have an extremely low unemployment rate. So that February of 2020 uh, unemployment rate of 3.5% uh, was the lowest since the, the 1960s, since uh, the late 1960s. We're nearly at that level of unemployment again. And we've been uh, uh, several months at that rate of 3.6%. So if you think about a recession, a recession is a period where we have a uh, contraction across many different sectors of the economy. One of the main ways that we time and measure recessions is the unemployment rate moving up, people losing their jobs. And we're just not seeing that. The demand for labor is so high that that unemployment rate continues to be very low. So again, this is something that the Fed is looking at and is, uh, uh, you know, is essentially giving them uh, more confidence that the economy is holding up. We're also seeing uh, wage growth is starting to moderate. Um, now, it's great to see uh, wages moving up if you're a, a, a worker uh, in, a, in a company, but it's really tough for those business owners and for the overall inflationary picture. One of the big fears uh, is that if we have very high wage growth, which we do, I mean, it, our wage growth is still high at 5.1%, but that wage growth can drive inflation even higher. We call that a wage price spiral. 
And that's been one of the concerns. So it's good to see that wage growth starting to moderate, but we also need to see that inflation come down. So kind of ending with the Fed, what is the Fed, uh, how is the Fed looking at this? Um, as recently as a year ago, the Fed was saying they expected to keep interest rates or the federal funds rate around zero for all of 22. They have uh, completely reversed that now. And the Fed is now uh, expecting that they'll raise the federal funds rate to around uh, three and a half percent. So that's 2% higher than it is right now, um, a year from now. And then also on the far right, uh, the Fed calls that the long run rate, but what it really is, is it's a neutral rate. So it's the, the rate at which uh, uh, the Fed funds rate is neither accelerating or decelerating the economy. So what the Fed is saying with their expectation of future inflation is that they will have to raise it above that two and a half percent to slow the economy. And right now we are seeing some signs of that slowing in the economy, but what the Fed is really focused on is that inflation. So uh, the, the expectations right now is that the Fed will continue to raise rates uh, over the next year. So when we look at the kind of uh, bringing it all together again, you see those really mixed indicators. We're in that, uh, that tra uh, transition uh, point in our economy right now. Um, overall, uh, the, the outlook with, with COVID is still looking good, especially in America. There is some risk still in uh, China. Uh, Macau just shut, shut down because of a, a, a COVID surge, but overall it's looking good. Economic growth, uh, and I'm really talking about GDP there and also kind of the different indicators. There is a high level of uncertainty right now in that overall economic growth. Job creation is strong. Uh, the unemployment rate uh, continues to be very low. I would argue it's too low. Um, I'd like to see uh, uh, more people coming back into the labor force, uh, increasing that labor force participation rate, but uh, our wage growth is starting to moderate, which is also a, a good sign. However, that consumer confidence is too low. People just don't feel good about the economy right now. Uh, inflation is coming down, but it needs to drop uh, significantly um, for the Fed to have more confidence. Uh, housing prices are starting to drop as well. Um, and I should say housing price appreciation is slowing. Uh, on, on an aggregate level, we're not seeing uh, housing prices lower than they were a year ago, but we are seeing that slowing uh, pretty quickly. And interest rates are going up. And I expect that when the Fed uh, uh, you know, meets in the next few weeks, they will continue that that. Uh, pathway of increasing interest rates. With that, I'll hand it over to you, Anthony. Thank you, Robert. Appreciate the update on the economy. And I'll take it from here on uh, financial markets. And those main items that Robert highlighted, slower growth, higher inflation, uh, and uh, all of those two being the main drivers that impacted a very negative first half for investors. And if you look at asset class performance across the board, very negative across the board, just a miserable first half if you're an investor. Fed rate hikes, higher inflation, slower growth, all of that playing a role into pretty weak investment performance. The only area that really bucked the trend was commodities, but as Robert mentioned, declining here in recent weeks. Uh, some safety in the bond market. You see municipal bonds and high quality bonds fared a little better, but still historically bad performance from bonds, worst six months for the Bloomberg Barclays aggregate on record. Uh, and you can see that small and mid cap stocks fared a little bit worse. So really no place to hide in financial markets, a lot of bad news priced in. And within sector performance in the equity market, really focused, the defensive areas did best, energy, utilities, consumer staples, and healthcare, uh, those top three, oddly enough, are where you see your highest dividends as well. We think high dividend stocks should be a core por portion of the portfolio, uh, a way to play defense. And what we see is continued volatility in the equity markets. So we do think high dividend paying stocks should be a key component of your investment portfolios. And you can see in the first half that technology and communication services, which are also uh, technology driven among the laggards as we had a pretty sharp reversal of some of the equity trends in recent years. So with that said, important to put into perspective just how bad it was. This is the trailing six month total return for a 60-40 stock bond portfolio. 
And you can see that following that blue line, it's the a second worst six month total return for a balanced portfolio, again, as represented by that 60 40 portfolio. So important to realize you've really lived through a really terrible investing period. And I do think things will improve from here, even if slightly, but put, important to put in perspective just how weak that first half was for both stock and bond investors. Uh, now, there is some light at the end of the tunnel. This is the top 10 worst six month performances for that 60 40 bond portfolio going back to 1976 and the start of the aggregate bond index. You can see that 2022 is the second worst, as mentioned. You can see the other periods as well. And eight out of the prior nine examples saw positive performance over the subsequent six months. Uh, we do think there's better value in bonds. Yields have come up a lot. I'll talk more about that here in a moment. Eight out of those nine periods positive with an average return of 11.3% for balanced portfolios as measured by the 60-40. So don't abandon your uh, balanced strategy yet. We do think uh, bonds are poised to provide better returns here going forward. Uh, and that what we saw is likely the worst for this type of balanced portfolio uh, in the past. Let me touch on sentiment in the equity markets. And I think this is a key point and why the equity market has bounced a little bit since mid-June, uh, today's decline notwithstanding, but the S&P, even with a modest decline in the last couple of days, still up 4% from the mid-June lows. Important to recognize just how negative investor sentiment was in mid-June, and that's where these two stats were taken. On the left is the percentage of S&P 500 stocks above their 50-day moving average, and this is really a gauge of momentum, and you can see uh, on that measure, it was down to 2%. So only 2% of stocks in the S&P 500 were above their 50-day average. And on the right side of this chart, the percentage of stocks above their 200-day was 12%. You can see just looking at these two charts, that is historically low. And what that represents is investors selling everything and anything they can in a bit of a panicky environment. That in and of itself doesn't make a market bottom, but it does highlight some of the extreme pessimism that often can cause markets to overshoot on the downside. So that was a big factor uh, in June. It's also important to know that there were back-to-back -back weekly declines of 5% in June. That's only happened seven times. Historically, that's been a good short-term indicator for equities. Uh, there are also three consecutive days where declining stocks outnumbered uh, rising stocks 10 to 1 uh, and five days where 90% of or more of the S&P or the NYSE declined on the day, which had only happened in 1928. So some historically rare uh, sentiment in the bond market. And uh, I think worth noting as we look to put in uh, what could be a short term bottom, but again, uh, still uncertain whether the ultimate bottom is in. And I'll touch more on that in a moment. If we look back at prior quarters, when the S&P 500 was down 20% over two quarters, historically, we've seen a pretty good bounce back. And can you see the prior periods uh, where two quarters are down 20% or more in the S&P 500 and over the subsequent one and two quarters, and then of course a full year later, performance has been very strong uh, with only one decline in the subsequent one quarter period that was following the great financial crisis. But you can see pretty strong future performance when the market is down 20% or more over two consecutive quarters. So some, some reason for optimism here, a lot of bad news priced in. Uh, it may not be fully over there and I have to take that with a grain of salt. Here is the valuation metric most followed in the market. It's the PE ratio for the S&P 500. Uh, the blue line shows that this PE ratio has dropped fairly sharply here in 2022 from around 22 to roughly 16 and a half. That's just below the 15 year average marked by the gold line there. I do highlight here in the red circles, the PE ratio at the bottom of the market. So it's certainly wouldn't be without precedent for the market to get cheaper here, especially if we do, if the economy does fall into a recession or if corporate profits weaken, I'll get to that in a moment. But although a significant adjustment has occurred, we may still see some weaker valuations in the form of selling in the equity market, but important to realize none the same, this is a pretty significant valuation adjustment for stocks. Turning to earnings, it's almost universally expected uh, that earnings uh, will be weaker by the end of this year, 
one of the positives for stocks looking back since the COVID pandemic started is that earnings surprise to the upside. Those are the gold bars. Those are actual results of S&P 500 earnings versus consensus at the start of earnings. You can see the consistent beats with the margin narrowing in recent quarters. Second quarter earnings season begins this week. This will be a key test for the market to see what degree will profits meet expectations or fall short of those. I do think that forecasts for the second half of the year are too high. This again, as I mentioned, a universally accepted uh, belief. So how far those forecasts come down, and we hope to find that out over the coming weeks, could play a role in determining what is the right uh, level for the equity markets. We still think it's feasible to get positive earnings growth over the remainder of the year, even if it's mid-single digit, which would be supportive for mid-single digit type returns for the equity market. But this will be a key test over the coming weeks for the equity markets and expect those forecasts to come down. Taking a step back, important to look at all of the bear markets and near bear markets since 1950. And we are still in the bear market, S&P down about 20% from its high. At one point it was down 24%. And again, if you look at history and here I show the market peak, the market low, cumulative decline, how long it lasted, the recovery date, the time to recover to the prior high and whether or not that sell-off occurred with a recession. And you'll see two things in the averages below. One, that the recession average is certainly worse, a decline of 37% for the market and lasted more than a year, 16 months, with a recovery uh, that lasted longer at 3.6 years. However, if it does not, if we do not have a recession, uh, the market may have seen the lows down 24%, which is roughly in line with the 23% percent decline uh, that we see typically in a non-recessionary decline and the recovery could be quicker. The main takeaway here is that you've seen a lot of the declines as an investor. If you have lived through this, uh, important to stay invested, stick with your financial goals, especially if nothing has changed. Um, don't try to time the market that leads to even worse investment results over time. So do be aware of how far we've come in comparison to prior bear markets uh, over the past 70 years. Another reason why if we do have a recession, why it's impossible to time markets, here's all of the recessions since World War II and when the market bottomed. Uh, you can see the length of the recession listed here as well. The average, uh, in, in average, the stock market has bottomed three months prior to the end of a recession and the performance from that bottom to the end of recession is 27%. That is a big gain. Very costly to miss out on that, impossible to time. What makes this harder to do is that the recession is ultimately defined by the National Bureau of Economic Research, who doesn't announce a recession until well after the recession has likely started and or in some cases even ended. So it's, it's impossible to time and although the data might continue to look bad, important to know that the market's bottom before the end of a recession. So one more reason not to time the markets, stay invested, uh, take a more conservative view, perhaps with more bonds if you need to. Uh, but again, it pays to stay invested. Only one exception to this, this case was in 2001, uh, where the corporate accounting scandals led to subsequent decline in 2002, which was after the market ended. But otherwise, uh, all of those cases, uh, prior cases, markets bottomed before the end of a recession. Let me take a change gears a little bit to performance and um, how you position your portfolio. Active management has come back to add some value in markets and for many years, passive investments, ETFs have outperformed their active manager counterparts. When markets get volatile, you tend to see active management doing better. And that is again, the case here in 2022 through the first six months of this year. In our portfolios, we use a combination of both ETFs and mutual funds to help uh, active management, to help outperform or deliver investment results over time. Uh, however, important to note that in those volatile environments, and we do think this volatility is going to stay, especially with the Fed raising rates and uh, not removing their participation from bond markets, that active management can once again add value and may continue to add value. So that red dot shows that 58% of active managers in the large cap space outperformed their benchmarks over the first half of 2022. We think that trend continues as markets stay volatile. 
We turn to bond markets and one another metric that has us cautious is the credit markets, the high yield market, the average yield advantage to comparable treasuries reached close to 6%. It's five and a half roughly today. That is above the historical average and it's a signal from bond markets to be wary of credit quality and the prospect of higher defaults in the coming months. In our bond portfolios, we have upgraded credit quality and think that that will be the, um, the wise move here as we await clarity on the path of the economy. So higher quality, we think in bond portfolios is, is the right move here, having some exposure to corporate bonds, of course, but do know that the bond markets, credit markets are sending a signal here as well. In terms of high quality bonds, and Robert touched on this as well, as of July 5th, the bond market, or the futures market showed the Fed raising rates to, uh, in fact, got to three and a half percent in early 2023 with rate cuts priced in after that, almost three priced in in 2023. The risk to high quality bonds after a pretty significant rise in interest rates is if the Fed is forced to raise rates more uh, than three and a half percent, say to four percent, that could re that could lead to renewed selling uh, in the bond market. But as we see those commodity prices come down and as we expect inflation to peak over the summer here in 2022, we think the worst is behind the bond market. And also important to recognize that the 10-year Treasury yield has doubled since the start of 2022, a historically sharp increase in interest market interest rates. And for investors, that's more income to start receiving. It's more income to reinvest. And we do think that that will help with performance going forward. So the outlook for fixed income um, has certainly improved on a go forward basis. So don't shy away from bonds. They're a key risk buffer that we think their role as a risk buffer will return. And if I could uh, just summarize uh, from an investment standpoint, it, we do think volatility is going to persist for the inequities, maintain that exposure to high dividend paying stocks and fixed income increased credit quality uh, could be a, still a bumpy ride over the remainder of the year, but if earnings remain positive, even the mid-single digits, that should provide some uh, back, positive backdrop for stocks over coming months. We do think that mid-single digit return uh, will likely persist beyond uh, this year and into the next several years as well. So that's our view on the markets. On behalf and the economy, on behalf of everyone at Wealth and Fiduciary Services, thanks very much for listening. I'm Anthony Valeri, and we'll speak to you again soon.